mute everybody. So then unmute yourself again if you need to speak, like myself, Lee, and Arjun. So I'm going to mute everybody now, though. All right. Well, Matt and Lee, thank you once again. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your, your promptness and participation. Uh, can you hear me OK? Awesome. Uh, Wine Cellars University Part 3 in the series. We uh, really appreciate Matt and Lee and their time and the dedication uh, for us to learn uh, not only about Wine Cellars portfolio, uh, but also about some, some important industry facts and and how, how the application works. So with that, I appreciate, I want to thank everybody for their time in advance for this hour and uh, would want to definitely encourage participation as we have in the past. And I'm going to turn it over to Matt. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arjun. Thanks, Arjun. Thanks, everybody. All right, so let me share here. Sorry, one second. Mm -hmm. We did see happened. it for a quick, quick second. Yeah, there. I had to include computer sound. All right, so here we go. I'm back. That's OK, good. perfect. All right, well, this one, uh, so I'll preface this. We're, we're going to go through uh, on-premise a little bit of the basics of on-premise sales as well as, you know, what's happening today in the on-premise sector. So uh, one thing we did want to make sure we mention is that, of course, some of you have been selling to on-premise for a long time. So please don't take this as us trying to talk down to anybody. It's more about giving our viewpoints about, uh, you know, how the segment can work, how our wines can fit into the segment, uh, and how to help build wine lists. So um, I will do a lot of the speaking on this one as opposed to Lee, because uh, this is more about sales as opposed to just education, which is what is obviously Lee's title, Vice President of Education. Uh, but we will do this in tandem. He will jump in and out. Um, as Arjun said, please feel free to ask questions and, uh, and you know, raise your hand if needed. I think best to put them into the chat. And then as we go, one of us will keep an eye on the chat and, and grab the questions as we go along. Um, also, as usual, this will be available uh, offline once we're done. We'll have the recording of the presentation as well as the PowerPoint uh, slash PDF that we can send out as well. So uh, if you need that, please reach out to your local uh, wine sellers person and they will make sure they get it right to you. Um, and as well, Lee and I will also have our information there. So the beginning slides are going to be pretty similar to what you've seen in the past. I think it's always important to reinforce how important the partnership between wine sellers and Winebow is, which is why we do these, which is why we think they're important um, and, and, and why we you know, obviously appreciate that that relationship. So I will also preface this by the the, the name of this presentation, you know, uh, selling to on premise and, and and our top glassable wines. This does come from uh, from Arjun actually. It's one of his favorite words, glassable, right, Arjun? So that's that's where that comes from, and that's what we're using. Uh, as you guys know, the story of wine cellars. You know, this started in the the late 1970s, where a family owned business that started in 1977 uh, officially started selling in 1978 by Yale Sager. Um, now run uh, by the co-presidents and, and Yale's sons, Adam and Jordan Sager. Um, and really this timeline is, as, as we've always said, it's here to show you that the suppliers we represent, we have represented for decades, you know, uh, many of which our biggest supplier being Zaccardi and Santa Julia, we've represented since 1995. So um, long-term partnerships with family-owned estates, we are a family business, and we take the partnership with Winebow as family as well. And I think that's important for us to point out. Um, and, and, and we are actually pre-Winebow, right? We partnered with Country Vintner and Stakel and Quality and Henry Wine Group and all the old names out there that then were, were became part of Winebow. So both of us kind of grew up together. And I think it's important to point that out as we as we go along here. So this is the way the portfolio lays out. As everybody knows, we are we we have a, a, a strong, deep, and rich portfolio that goes across countries across the entire world. We represent wines from every major uh, country in the world, with the exception of South Africa. 
Um, and we, we really work hard to have uh, family owned estates where possible, value driven, high quality wines. Uh, that out that really outbox their weight class. That's what's important to wine sellers. So we want to we want to be out there sell, selling wine. We also do not look for a lot of redundancy, with the exception of Germany, which is very deep and rich for us. Most of our portfolio re, rep, has one major represent representative of a of a major region, and we try not to have, like I said, a lot of redundancy in there. Portfolio, you know, groupings, as you guys know, this is how it lays out. But I will point out the gray section, which is Sager Family Selections. These are brands that we own, uh, brands that we own and represent and are excited to represent. So these are the markets uh, that that we are with you guys, as I've pointed out uh, in the past call in the past calls. But 14 markets all across the East Coast and uh, in the West Coast. Uh, certainly our biggest distributor partnership, um, and it's a lot of business in those markets. You know, really every one of those states, we're either at index uh, or, or outperforming. So we appreciate all the hard work that you guys put into our business out there. Um, and one of the things I would like to point out on this map is that, you know, with you, Wine, Winebow, right, you guys are heavily uh, on-premise focused through the past, right? You are a fine wine company, and you've had a lot of business in on-premise through the past years. Wine sellers pre-COVID, you know, right now we have pre-COVID and post-COVID. Pre-COVID was 50% on-premise. So it is certainly in the DNA of wine sellers to sell to on-premise. Um, and I will also put out there that myself personally, um, I spent 10 years working in restaurants and I started as a busboy and a host and moved my way up to a beverage director of a multi-unit and GM of a multi-unit. So I, I certainly have a lot of love for the on-premise segment. And I work, uh, and, and it's it's near and dear to my heart. So we're we're all happy to see it growing again. Um, although it has slightly slowed through the spring, I do expect a strong summer, and I think you guys all will as well. Uh, but it has it has been a great year in 2022 for on premise, um, and it's and it's great to see you guys continuing to grow there as well. Like I said, 300,000 cases across 14 states, which is important for you all to know. So state of the restaurant industry, you know obviously unique right uh, it has changed for somebody that was spent 10 years in restaurants i can't even fathom how it, what it's like to to be owning and working in restaurants today things have sure changed quite a bit um, inflation and labor remain at the top of mind, right? 92% of operators surveyed say costs are a significant issue. Probably every segment you talk to anywhere will say the same thing, but in on-premise, that means a lot because costs are, very, it's a penny business, right? You're making penny margins and you're trying to just, you know, bring in as much as you can. Uh, on premise, although the growth is almost back to what it was, the actual business, the sales in on premise are almost back to what they were pre COVID. There's there were 400,000 uh, jobs below the pre pandemic levels. So I mean, it tells you that there that these people are being stretched and stretched, and there is a lot less wor workers doing the same amount of work, which is certainly something for us all to keep in mind. Um, consumers are worried about personal finances, right? 64% of adults say their finances are in fair or poor condition in the United States, which is, you know, obviously not a great thing because on-premise is a luxury, uh, but that is certainly the case. So that's something to take hold of. Uh, value is key and everywhere in the world now, but especially in restaurants. So loyalty and rewards programs have become very big um, and important again, and people are searching for these. Um, Off-premise off-premises will continue to shine. So this is not talking about retail sales. This is talking about to go. So in markets where it's still legal or it was made permanently legal to take alcohol, buy wine from a store and bring it to go, buy food to go, um, that is going to continue to be big. And, and there's not a restaurant that exists today that, I mean, that will exist in the future, that will open up, that will not have a big to go uh, plan in place because to go has become a whole new game, especially like I said, the places where it's legal, um, like, you know, walking around the Jersey shore with drinks in hand, right? Uh, competition is heating up. So this is the other piece. Half of operators expect intense competition in 2023. People that own restaurants are expecting that competition. 
2022 was a challenging year, but the competition was not crazy. There wasn't a lot of people opening new at that point. People expect that in 2023, and we're starting to see it already. We certainly know from our na- our major national account restaurants that we are uh, that we are seeing them expand pretty rapidly. Right, uh, the Fogo de Chaos and Landry's and Darden's of the world are really starting to expand their footprints out there. So uh, many restaurant owners also have that growth mindset, right? Three and four operators say business conditions are close to normal or positive and they're on their path. So they're focusing on sustaining growth and having a great 2023. Uh, All this data, by the way, is from National Restaurant Association in 2023. So it's all accurate data as of this year. So by the numbers, uh, food service industry sales are projected to reach uh, nine hundred ninety seven billion dollars in twenty twenty three. Right. Fantastic. Industry workforce is projected to grow by five hundred thousand jobs for a total industry employment of fifteen point five million by the end of this year. But if you do that math from what I said previously, basically the world is expecting the levels to get back to 19 as far as hiring is concerned by the end of this year with growth on top of it. So it still means we're going to have an understaffing. Right. There's still an understaffing out there. Uh, The top challenges, of course, that we all want to keep an eye for, 92% of operators say higher food costs are a significant challenge, but that is a benefit. We'll talk about it later. For you in the wine and spirits business, that is a benefit, the higher food costs, because it puts more and more pressure on the the bar and, and the wine and spirits program to generate more and more revenue to make up for those food costs, right? We all know how it works. Uh, 47% of operators expect the competition from other restaurants to be more more intense, as I stated before, and 62% report being understaffed. We know that, right? Um, during much of 22, there was only one unemployed person for every two jobs, which is the lowest level on record across the country. So two things to be mindful of. When, when Because of these challenges and the numbers here, as, as selling to on-premise, that your buyers have a limited amount of time, right? As you know, um, we, we there's no more that we can walk in and have a one, an hour and a half, two hour conversation with our favorite buyer, right? They have a limited amount of time. Number two, buyers are not always specialized in wine. And actually we're seeing more and more of that. I was recently in New York City at a, a high end restaurant where the GM was now doing the buying. They decided not to rehire a wine director and the GM was doing it. And the GM had no wine background. And this is New York City, right? A place that has really high expectations of their bar program. So you're seeing more and more of that. But the buyers are not necessarily specialized in wine. You have new buyers and you have multi-category buyers, right? Somebody that was buying for, you know, for the, the kitchen is now buying the wine as well. So super important for us to understand there is benefits to that for you. Because I know when I was a sales rep, which was over 20 years ago, but as a sales rep, um, I, I surely was a consultant and I was writing lists for a lot of accounts myself. They were expecting that of me. It was a part of my job. And uh, and I think that that's coming back to me personally. I think this will lend it for us to come back as the consultants we are, not as salespeople trying to force things down their throat, but as consultants helping to sell, uh, to helping them to build a wine list that will work for them and their customers, right? And that's what we'll get more into as we go forward. Um, just a couple of consumer trends uh, that that are important to point out here. But 66% of consumers are more likely to order food for takeout than they were in 19. So that's important to know. Consumers are comfortable, so that then that can also affect the wine program if they're allowed to buy wine and spirits or canned cocktails or whatever to go. Uh, Consumers are comfortable with and expect to be able to use technology to pay, earn points, and earn rewards. Again, that rewards thing. Uh, Certainly, your best restaurants should understand that they need to build those loyalty programs because they are getting more and more important. Um, But what's most important of this is that 64% of consumers consider restaurants essential to their lifestyle. What I said previously that you know, when when finances are stretched, restaurants are a luxury. The great thing is that since COVID, when people were locked up and could not go out to eat, and that central point of a pub restaurant that was that has been so important in human culture since the earliest of times, you know, we saw losing that what it felt like. So even though we are in a strange economy with with a lot of uh, a lot of ebbs and flows, and there are people certainly hurting and stretching their finances, 64% of people still believe that restaurants are essential to their life. 
right? Which means they're still going to go out to eat. They're going to look for value. They're going to make sure that they're buying things that they understand, but uh, and, and not taking risks. But they are still going to go out to eat. Uh, and lastly, change uh, working from home is changing the way consumers uh, use restaurants. Which means if you're in a major city, let's say like New York City, San Francisco, uh, Miami, wh whatever city, DC, you know that may affect your major met metropolitan areas where you had all these office workers coming down to eat. But in the inverse, it's going to help your suburban restaurants where somebody's working from home and they want to take an hour break for lunch and they go and eat at a restaurant that they would never have gone to previously. So it does give that benefit. Uh, operational trends. And most important points here, full service operators continue to keep menus streamlined. We'll get into that, but menus are getting smaller and, 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 and more streamlined, right? Very important. More than nine in 10 operators to set up outdoor dining and nine in 10 who start selling alcohol to go plan to keep doing so where permitted. As I said, outdoor dining and, and to go alcohol are certainly a piece that none of us want to forget about. And a lot of people, it's never been a part of our thoughts, right? So even these restaurants that had a no outdoor space and we're now given it and they're allowed to keep it, it's going to ex expand the amount of space they have available. Um, and selling restaurant, you know, alcohol to go is certainly important. The con of this is that it's the same competition for fewer spots, right? It's a smaller list. You're going up against all the same sales reps and potentially all the same wineries. Uh, so you have a small competition for few spots. But the pro is that every time you get a spot, the volume is exponentially more, right? That spot is more and more important every single time because, because it, the, the lists are more streamlined. You're not seeing as many restaurants with 50 wines by the glass. So if you can get a by the glass, if you can get a sub $100 wine list placement, you're going to see more turn out of it, which is the important piece. I am a half glass full kind of guy. So that's certainly the half glass full way to look at it. So how do we sell to on-premise in today's climate? So quick video just to keep everybody engaged. Any wine tonight? Uh, we'll have your second cheapest wine. Very good, sir. Second cheapest wine. You don't know much about wine, but you do know that you shouldn't get the cheapest. That's why we make it easy for you to get the second cheapest. Second cheapest wine. Second cheapest wine is fermented from only the finest of the second cheapest grapes. We'd elaborate, but you'd have no idea what we're talking second about. Second cheapest wine. Yep, it's, it's wine. Second cheapest wine is in the front of all wine stores, so you don't have to search while the clerks obviously judge you. 2004. Impress your friends with a year that's not the current year, because trust us, that's good. And hold the glass like this, because that's also good. Second cheapest wine. Second cheapest wine. Outside of the cheapest, it's the cheapest. All right. Also, try our new cheapest wine for our under 21 customers. <laughs> I love All how right, they so. move that up to Yellowtail. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, you know, the point of that is a lot of your consumers are not, you know, are not really see, you know, don't, don't really necessarily know what they're buying. They're looking at lists and they're buying based on price segments. So it's part of what we have to think about as consultants as well, is that we're not just selling, you know, what our palate is. We're not just selling, you know, wines that are on quota, you know, sorry, Arjun, and we won't get too much into that because that's hard, right? But, uh, but certainly we're also looking at, you know, what price points are missing, what consumers are going to go after and understanding, you know, where that fits in it as well. So number one, again, so a lot of this stuff, let's call it self-explanatory, but I, we're, we're talking to people here that have done this for a long time and new sales reps, people from all over the country. So I do think it's important that we get back to the basics to some extent. I'll move pretty quickly because we do have a lot of content here. Um, but like I said, put notes in the, in the uh, chat box and Lee will jump in and, and, uh, if if needed. So first and foremost, you know, we want to look at the food menu and identify the cuisine straightforward. Right. Um, you know, and I think that it's forgotten a lot. People walk in and they say, OK, I need to sell 
whatever it is, you know, Billy Bob's Cabernet from Lodi. Okay. This is what I need to sell. So they walk into every account that day with Billy Bob's, you know, when it comes to restaurants, as we all know, it's a little bit different and it's certainly something we have to take into account. What does the food menu look like? What is the cuisine, you know? Um, and, and how, what is in my portfolio, hopefully by my preferred suppliers, but what is in my portfolio that I can help fit, uh, this, this cuisine can, can pair well with it. Um, we have to ask questions, of course, of the buyer uh, and of the people that work at the restaurant about menu seasonality, specials. Do they do specials? Are they changing the menu every few months? Is the wine list going to follow that same trend? Um, we want to take special note of prices and level of service, right? It's totally different if you're walking in um, and you see, you know, $50 entrees and you see white tablecloths and uh, and, and crummers and all that stuff. Then if you're walking into your local pub and, and it's wood tables that are a little bit sticky and wings and baskets, right? Totally different. So that's something we want to take note of. Um, we want to identify if the cuisine is locally sourced or country specific. Um, you know, if it is a, a, a locally sourced organic restaurant, right? We've got some spots, right? We know exactly what we're going to be talking about within our portfolio that, that can fit that, right? Do you have things local? Or do you have things that are organic? Do you have things that have a real sense of place? They'll probably fit better there. Um, we want to identify the, the, the wine menu holes that fit the concept or neighborhood. And that's part of the consultant piece, which we will get into later. But, you know, we all know it. We walk in, we look at a restaurant menu, and we see, like, how do they not have any bar? You know, this is an Italian restaurant in a major city. How don't they have Barbaresco on the menu? Right. How don't they have one? So that's one of the first things we do. We sit down, look at the menu, go through those holes, identify where where we see them. And if we're not presenting that day, we leave, you know, get get what fits those holes, get pricing together and 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 come in with a real valued presentation. Right. Um, we want to take note of which competitors have placements. Everybody knows this, too, but there's some restaurants that it's obviously owned by this distributor or that. You know, wh where can we fit in around that distributor? How can I find a way to engage with this restaurant that I'm able to get past their best friend who they went to high school with who works at this distributor? You know, so if, if that's the case and it's owned by one distributor, we, we, we really have to look at, you know, slowly taking steps to getting placements in this account, as opposed to like coming in full force and expecting to take over the list, right? So it's an important piece to notice as you're doing this longer and longer, you guys know in your markets, which, you know, which distributor sells what wines and it's pretty easy to identify. Um, ownership and restaurant values is a piece that I think sometimes we forget. In fact, I forgot, Lee told me to add it here, but women owned, family owned, environmentally conscious, you know, if, if see what the ethos of this restaurant is and how we can fit into that ethos with the wines we present. And don't look as sad as this guy in the picture. Smiling will certainly be much better. It's because he doesn't have a um, glass of wine in front of him. Exactly. That's true. He's upset. So uh, number two, uh, we, and, and you'll notice the beginning here that we're not going to talk about wines. We will do that in the latter slides towards the end. We'll talk about some of our wines, where they fit, where they're buy, what their buy the glass price points are. Um, so understanding the size and scope, again, pretty straightforward, right? But is the wine is the wine menu 50 or 500 bottles? What's the price ranges, right? Is the is it capped off at 150 bucks or do they have things that go up to the thousands? Uh, where the, where's the buy the glass pricing, right? Um, is the menu heavy in certain countries? Um, you know, uh, if you walk into a restaurant and they've got 50 Italian wines and six French wines, I mean, this for me is appropriate because when I walk in to many, especially high level fine dining restaurants, I see a major hole across the entire United States. So I cover the country. I travel almost every day. Um, I'm eating in every state uh, for the most part. And, and one thing I notice always in these high level top James Beard award winning restaurants is a lack of Argentina, right? Perfect. Perfect to, to tie it into brands. To me, I see it everywhere. And it's the first thing I think if I'm selling to this restaurant and it's, it's all high level, I'm coming in with some of my gems from South America because they don't, they're not covering a lot of different categories, a lot of different areas, you know, so let me try to be the Argentinian king of this restaurant, right? Um, even your most important restaurants in the country, I see that whole personally. So I, to me, I see that as an opportunity. But still, if you walk in and you see this menu is hugely leaning 
speaking Italian and most of the major places are covered, then you've got to, you know, turn around your, your proposal a little bit and start looking at France or USA or Spain or other areas where you could potentially find your way in. Um, of course, the most, you know, a pretty straightforward one, but is the format progressive, varietal or regional? Um, I, you know, everybody understands that, I'm sure. But, you know, basics of it, you know, obviously, is it done? Is it done by region? Is it is it broken out by what type of wine it is or progressive where it's body style, which you see a lot less of, but a lot. But you do see it in some major metropolitan markets, right? Light reds, you know, medium reds, uh, you know, fuller bodied reds, etc. So certainly um, that's a piece to understand because that also affects what you can present. You can double up more on countries if it's done progressively because you don't have to worry about overloading a country within there. Um, does the buyer show their personal taste or do they stick to the restaurant theme? Uh, again, something that all of us should look at and understand because you need to know who you're selling to. And, and, and we all know these restaurants too, restaurants we love, buyers that are well known. You look at the menu and there's so many things missing and it's obvious that they love, you know, the Savoie, right? <laughs> and they're just loaded with wines from there. So, um, but, but then that helps you understand who you're, who you're selling to and, and how you can get them. Can you, go, can you go after flavor profiles that may fit what their favorite wines are that are not within those regions? Um, and, and that's going to be a pretty straightforward way to go after a buyer as opposed to the restaurant menu. Um, how are the wines listed, right? Are, are they cleanly written? Do they, do they have things correct? Are there spelling errors? Are they not putting the name of the producer in? All that sort of stuff becomes important because it tells you what type of buyer you're dealing with. Is it, a, is it a very particular buyer who understands wine or is it somebody that's just rushed through this and threw a menu together? you know, um, or an inside sales account that was, you know, paid for menus and they got poor ones and they didn't understand it. Um, are they hitting the important by the glass, by the bottle price points? That's another important one. One of our national account people actually recently told me about, you know, talking to one of the major on-premise chains in the United States and how they said to him, how do we how do we sell? You know, you tell me, how do I sell $12 Malbec, right? And and one of the things we discussed was, was you know, having a, you know, you've got three different cabs at eight, 10, 12, and 15. You got four cabs, right? Why do you have one Malbec at 10? You know, why isn't there an opportunity to have one, two, or three different Malbecs at different levels from different areas that tell different stories about the country of Argentina? Um, so certainly there's ways to go after those price points and finding the holes within the list. Um, and then, of course, how many wines are listed by the glass? That, of course, helps with usage, you to understand the usage, but also it shows you, you know, if, if, if there's only 12 wines by the glass, you might be able to get one or two of them if you're really lucky, right? So you can't go in with only sub $10 wines that you're trying to get into by the glass. All right. Hey. Ed, go ahead, Lee. Uh, Matt, I, I think that's a perfect opportunity when you were talking about um, how to list wines. Um, that we're going to come out with our own perfect wine list. You want to make sure that our wines, you know, are for sure listed properly so the consumer recognizes them properly and then can go out and purchase them outside of the, the restaurant properly. So, Matt, that was yeah. just a little preview on a, on a document that's forthcoming for wine sellers, our perfect wine list, how we want stuff listed yeah. um, in terms of producers and varietals and regions. Yeah, keep your eye out for that. We're excited. It's it's going to list every single SKU we sell, how we want it listed, uh, what the what the potential by the glass and by the bottle price is. Um, I think it's important personally. We've been working on it for a long time. That takes a lot of time, but you'll have it this summer. Um, but certainly uh, for us as suppliers, really important that things are laid out correctly and clearly because not we there's nothing we hate more than seeing like our wine on six different menus in the same city all in different di written differently names of producers missing so we're going to try to help with that i think it's important for all of us to know arjun did i see a hand up from you oh uh, no i'm good thank you all right appreciate it. it matt yeah uh, so we're going to focus on profit again. This is uh, I'm not going to get too deep into this, but I was a buyer in restaurants for a long time. Um, certainly this is how I looked at it myself, uh, but some things have changed. Right. Um, you know, over the time for many, many years, your average by the glass pricing was a 400 percent markup. Right. You walk in and you say this is eight dollars a bottle. So they serve it for eight dollars a glass. Right. Almost everywhere. That's been the way it is for a long time. Um 
except in places like New York City where it may be more and in small towns where it may be less. But in general, let's say the average is 400 percent. Your average buy the bottle pricing, of course, is about 300 percent. Again, not everywhere, but that's your average where it's like 300, you know, three times, three times the price. That's that's what the that's what it sits as. You buy it for 15, it becomes 45 on the wine list. Um, so we want to find buy the glass items, obviously with that mark with that markup difference and the margin difference that comes from it. We want to find buy the glass items that the buyer can make long margins on. Everybody knows that. Uh, it, the, the easiest spot that everybody shoots for is Pinot Grigio, right? Everybody says that the less it tastes like wine, the more it's going to sell, right? You sell them a $4 Pinot Grigio, they sell it for $8 a glass. Everybody's ecstatic. So that's certainly the one that people look for the most. But the, the new world today that people are really looking towards, your advanced Psalms are really looking at, and I don't mean actually categorized as advanced, but people that understand the industry are not are really pushing more and more towards blended by the glass pricing. Right. That's a piece that I think is a little more modern, is important for us all to remember. And it can be part of our pitch. Blended by the glass pricing would be, OK, yes, this this Pinot Grigio costs you five dollars. You're going to sell it for eight. And yes, I have this champagne that's thirty dollars, but we need to put it on your wine list at twenty five so that we can so that we can really sell this wine because it's not going to sell at thirty. And that's what your more progressive wine lists and buyers are doing. Um, certainly, it's something for you to look into as well. Blended by the glass pricing, where you can sell some higher end wines and still get them in by the glass range because you're offering them lower priced wines that they can make really fat margin on. Um, that's an important piece of putting a wine list together in today's world. And and as we mentioned mentioned everybody's tight on margins that's us that's you that's the restaurant food costs are skyrocketing and food prices can only really go up so high so this is where the money comes from so you have to base your pitch on profit because the owner of that restaurant is expecting this bar to generate almost all the profit that that restaurant makes if you worked in bar programs before you know that you are as a bar manager or a beverage director you are expected to give every ounce of profit in that restaurant is expected to come out of your bar so it is very important um we want to present items that you know will move from suppliers you can count on all right um, as as I say in every pitch I've ever made, I have zero interest in selling you a wine that's going to sit on your list or is going to sit in your back in the back room you're in. I have zero interest, right? Just like you guys can't only sell wines that are that are on program, right? Uh, because you need to sell things that are going to work. You have to build trust that way. So we want to present items that we know will move, but you also want to make sure, and this is not just me being overzealous, you want to make sure that the suppliers are people you can count on, right? The smaller and smaller surprise suppliers in, in general, you will have less and less inventory. And, and I mean, I don't want to say less and less, but you'll have less availability of inventory. You'll have out of stocks, you know, that can happen. So if you're selling to an important customer, you want to make sure it's somebody you can lean on that, you know, hey, I can call up you know, Christina, if you're in DC, right? And and Christina can help me out and bring me a case if I run out of this on a Sunday, right? That That's what you want to rely on. And that's what you want to make sure you're pitching because that goes along with the profit. Um, we want to focus on suppliers that will come in and support the business. Again, I'm not being overzealous. When I was a buyer, I absolutely asked these questions. Uh, you know, who who's representing this wine? Do they have somebody local? Are they going to come in and do dinners with their managers and their team? To me, it is extremely important. We want to pick things that are fitting the restaurant, that, that can be esoteric, that can hit trends. But we also want to make sure that those wines are being supported. You all know it. You walk into these restaurants and and I come from I live in New Jersey now, but I come from Boston, where Boston proper, we have a multitude of restaurants that have the most esoteric list you've ever seen from people you've never heard of. And and very often in the city of Boston, those restaurants close down. And one of the major reasons is they don't have the support, right? They have this huge wine list. It's in it's in depth, it's rich, but nobody's coming in having large parties buying glasses of wine, nobody's supporting that business. And and that is certainly a piece of profit that people forget about. Remember, lean on people like us. We are there to spend money. We are there to go in and support the business that you guys get from us. So lean on that for sure. Um, also, we want to start small with well-known varietals or regions until you build trust and you know the customers better. You know that, but you know we don't want to throw a you know an orange wine 
onto a Chili's bar and grill and expect it's going to do really well because once it doesn't do well and then you have to close out the case or you got to give them a, a special deal to, to get rid of the rest of it, they're not buying another buy the glass from you, right? So we want to start until we really understand and, tr and the customers can trust us. Once we do that, then we can start getting crazy. We know the customer's palate, just like if you owned a store, you would understand your best customers, what they like to drink, and they would start trusting you to give them whatever you wanted, as long as it fit within pricing parameters, because they knew you knew what they like to drink. Same thing with restaurants, same exact thing. Um, uh, and you'll you'll also you know alienate the buyer if you start throwing things out there that they're just like, this is never gonna work, and then it doesn't work. So you wanna make sure you build that trust first. Don't forget to pitch keg wine. We're gonna have that a little later in the presentation. Keg wine is important. We are selling a ton of keg wine. I said it to our sales team this year at our national sales meeting. That business has exponentially grown for us. And if our team is missing the keg wine, they are missing the boat if they are not selling it because it is a growing category and we have a lot of it. We have to be one of the largest selections of keg wines in the country at this point. Um, you want to offer one thing I will also mention as somebody that was a buyer as well as an on-premise sales rep in downtown Boston for many years. Um, you want to offer the account volume deals where it's applicable. I used to do this, right? Like I had um, Maggiano's, for example. It's a chain restaurant. Not a lot I can do with Maggiano's. I can't. They were my account. I called them every week. I stopped by every couple of weeks. It wasn't an account that I could generate, a, like I could bring things in and, and add items. But I could go to them and get a banquet pour of the Pinot Grigio and tell them it's a one on five. So they would buy that deal and, and have it for their banquets. Right. So that's the way you can get to some of these restaurants that are really stonewalling you is offer these volume deals. Don't forget about that. Right. If it's not a buy the glass price and, it, and it's uh, capable of you, then don't think a restaurant can't buy five or ten cases. You know, not everyone can, but many will um, if it's something that moves fast. Right. Your top your top pour in a top restaurant is probably selling eight to ten. 10 cases a week. So it's easy for them to do volume if you're doing that kind of business. Um, food sales typically account for 60 to 70% of gross revenue, right? But the beverage category, as I mentioned earlier, normally accounts for 80% or more of the GP dollars. So as I said, if you have ever bought for a restaurant, you know it. The pressure is on to make that bar so profitable that the owner can stay in business because they're not going to do it through the kitchen. <laughs> they're, not, they're just not going to. Which is why I don't understand how B BYOBs in New Jersey, where I am, exist. But they have high food prices. That's the only way they can do it. Uh, so you want to put number four, we want to put our pitch together thoughtfully. Um, again, straightforward. We'll go through these quickly. But don't just pitch quotas or priorities. The buyer will know. It's straightforward. Sorry, Arjun. We, all, we have priorities. We're part of quotas. You know, But you can't just pitch that. Or the buyer will know, and they will just disregard you. So we the important piece is if you have a supplier that is on quota or is a priority or is something you need to pitch, find something within that could fit. Don't go after the same wine over and over again, of course. Um, we want to ask questions, like I said at the beginning, about the most popular categories on the menu. Sometimes they're with, you know, they're, with their things we don't see, right? We, we see that they have a cab franc by the glass, and we're like, I'm not going to go after that. But then after talking with the buyer, you realize cab franc is one of their biggest categories. Okay, cool. Cab franc, maybe I can find another high acid red that I can potentially pitch as well. Maybe I can find a really cool Bernarda to put in there and try out, right? Um, we want to discuss specific food and wine pairings. Um, I think it's important, right? As, as you're putting your pitch together, you know, nothing impresses a buyer more. And as a buyer, I can say this is when somebody comes in and says, yeah, I looked at your, you know, wood plank salmon and I just really figured that that it would fit perfectly, you know, with this with this steely, you know, sans or this, you know, mineral driven sans serif from France or something like that. Right. Um, certainly those are important things uh, for us to, to go in with is to is to look at the menu put the, the what we're putting together with pairings, have answers about how we think this fits the menu. It impresses buyers and they say yes because they see you actually did your homework. Same thing remains true of a retailer, right? You walk in and you try to jam something down their throat. They say no. If you walk in, you say, I just looked at your Argentinian set. I see you have five Malbecs, but you have no organic Chardonnay. And I have a really good one I think you should try. I mean, you've given yourself an opportunity in a category they would have told you was completely shut off and they weren't adding to. So it's the way to look at a restaurant as well. Um, 
So we want to, uh, sorry, we want to look at the menu, uh, the pricing and plan accordingly. So off, obviously important, but you want to make sure you're not pitching $300 bottles of wine and a, on a price list on a, on a wine menu that has nothing over 150. We also want to make sure that you're not saying a $15 bottle is by the glass when everything they have is six to eight by the glass, right? So we want to just make sure that you've done that research ahead of time. You're thoughtfully looking through this. You understand you've taken notes and you're making sure that you are presenting as, as this account would like to see. Right. Um, we we want to make the presentation appropriate for the concept, obviously. Right. Um, we're not showing, you know, oak driven, you know, oak driven California Chardonnay to an account that is, you know, focused on organics and natural wine. Right. We want to make sure that we're really we're really working with what the concept is and putting together a presentation appropriate for it. Um, we want to find out if they change seasonally or they offer features. You want to know how often that menu changes because obviously if you put something on, it's going to be there for a year. It's a much different conversation than three months or six months. And it also means you could potentially present things that don't have a lot of inventory if you know it's a three-month list and you know you have enough to hold three months, right? So you want to make sure you know that. Um, and don't sell your palate only. Just like if I was talking to a buyer, I would say the same thing. You're not buying this menu, this wine for your palate. You're not selling the wine for your palate. You know, all of us sell things that we don't necessarily drink on a regular basis. We're selling to the public, right? You, you know, the people that drink mountains and mountains of Apothic and Joel Gott, right? We're, we're selling to these people. So we want to make sure that the, that we're selling what works for this menu in this area um, and not just for our palate. We want to also know what our competitors are pouring, uh, what their competitors are pouring, and be mindful of it. That's an important piece. Do not show the exact same wine to six restaurants in the area. Um, I, I want to be sensitive about that because I also don't think somebody gets to hold on. This is my buy the glass. Nobody else can have it. But you also can't put it right next door to them. You know, if you have a Zuccardi wine or a Santa Julia wine, you know, if you serve Santa Julia organic Malbec at this restaurant, doesn't mean it can't be Santa Julia organic Shard right next door. But you don't want to have, you want to be cognizant of what's what their true competitors are. They're not going to see it all, but you don't want to have, you don't want to be putting by the glasses right next door to one another. You will ruin confidence and relationships. Um, and it, it, it does no good because you'll get kicked out of accounts that way. So you, you can still find ways to use that. That supplier, just be smart about how you use them. Don't put the same by the glass everywhere in the same neighborhood. Do the math for them. This is especially true of keg wine. Come in with a per ounce cost and compare to bottle, right? Know your competitor's pricing, compare profit. You know, uh, many of you know what other competitors are selling wine at what price, right? So use that to, comp to compare what you're showing them and how much more profit they can make on your wine. Um, uh, discuss company policies with unsaleables, right? If you got, you know, if it's a policy within your market that, that if there's any issues with corkage, you'll pick it up. Or if the wine doesn't sell, you'll help them move it out uh, in another way. Discuss that policy so they feel protected and safe. Um, suggest what each item should be by the glass and by the bottle, right? Give them that pricing, just like any manifest the pricing. Tell them where it should be, where it is nationally, how it makes sense. Um, and, and, and so that the math is done for them. If you're presenting, and actually it's one thing as a sales rep that I, that I was always pointed out, uh, with, when I was when I was going with high level Psalms anyway, they would say, I always appreciate when you pitch to me, cause you give me the glass, the, the, the netted down price of what it costs a bottle, right? Where everybody else walks in and gives me a case price. And it kind of annoys me because I'm a restaurant. I want to know what the bottle cost is, right? So those little things can actually make a difference. If you're changing your pitch from a retailer to a restaurant, when I had a supplier with me as a sales rep, I always had two sheets. I had an on-premise sheet and I had an, a retail sheet that I would use throughout the day. I wasn't using the exact same sheet, um, uh, which is so simple, right? It takes you an extra five, you know, three minutes, and then you print out a few additional copies. You're good to go. Um, you want to find out the turn rate and show them how much total profit for month is possible. Super important as well. Prove it. Show them how much. How much you, you're selling eight cases of Pinot Grigio a week? That's 32, you know, cases a month. You're gonna make four. You're gonna make thirty dollars a bottle. Do all that math for them and let them see what it turns out to. Keep up with the trends. This is what I mentioned earlier. You're a consultant, and this is the opportunity to do so, to be a consultant, especially in the market today, where there's so many uneducated buyers out there. Just because, and I don't mean 
dumb buyers. I just mean uneducated in wine because they just haven't been trained and they've been thrown into buying the wine all of a sudden. So you are a consultant. Be the consultant. It's like the days of old. You can, wine salespeople were consultants and they wrote menus. They physically wrote the menus for restaurants. They were relied upon for their expertise. We're going back to that in today's world. So take advantage of it. And you all are experts. You've done this for a long time. Um, you are the buyer's best resource for the local and national market, right? They know their customers and they know their general vicinity, but you know more about what else is going on around them, what other restaurants are pouring. You're better at that. So you can really help them and they should understand that, right? Um, pointing out something missing can earn you instant trust and respect, right? If you're like every restaurant around here is doing extremely well with ro with dry rosé and you are you do, you have none on your menu, I think you should have one. I think you'll be surprised how well it does. Again, it's going to earn you a lot of trust and respect, right? Here are the rules of a consultant, right? This is this is stuff that I'm going to say anyway, right? It doesn't mean it should be tattooed on your body, but it's what I think it, rules of a consultant are. We want to eat out often and study the wine menu everywhere we go. We want to look at store shelves and displays, especially boutique shops, see what's really being pushed, what's what's empty, what's working in those shops, because the people buying at boutique shops are the same people that are buying at restaurants. We want to listen for consistencies in what your suppliers are presenting. You're going out with suppliers on a regular basis. You're annoyed and sick of it, but you're going to see what is getting more and more popular, right? What are people consistently coming in with, like natural wine, right? Um, watch closely which categories are moving quickest in your accounts. Pay attention to which items are being added to inventory regularly. Um, and pay it, it within your wholesale uh, within your distributor, right? Look at what keeps coming in, what those high inventory levels look like. Um, pay attention to what your top accounts and Psalms are excited about. Follow them on social media, see what they're talking about. Um, they are a plethora of knowledge to, to see what those, those young, uh, Psalms are really getting excited about. Um, this is the last, okay, there's two more. Balance the selections for them. You want that house Pinot Grigio, but don't come in with five different options for that spot. Bring a diverse selection of price points, flavor profiles, styles, and countries. Really important, be diverse. Don't be a one trick pony. Be cognizant of time, as I'm trying to be now, um, and bring the appropriate amount of wine to taste in the time, right? Make sure that you understand. You're not walking in there for two hours. These They don't have as much time. Bring a concise list of wines, show them, move through them quickly. Be like me and you're fast talking, right? Some of you, it's probably hard to keep up if you live in the South, but I'm just a fast talker. But that's what we need now, right? It's in today's world, we don't have a lot. There's nothing wrong with being a slow talker, all right? <laughs> just, I'm fast. Um, read the room quickly and move on if there is an interest, right? Uh, it's like everybody used to say, don't talk yourself out of a sale. Also, don't try to convince them of something you know they've moved on from. You're wasting your time. Let's go on to the next thing. Um, take notes thoroughly. Follow up is the most important part. It was the first thing anybody ever told me when I got into sales. You know, it is 90% follow up. We all know it. So many of your competitors lose opportunities because they, they get a yes and they never follow up again about it. So take notes. Come back with follow up. Lastly, do not forget the kitchen. This is something I, I came up in a fine wine distributor that was 50% Gallo, right? We had Dreyfus Ashby and Domain Select at the time and, and all sorts of Bordeaux and Burgundies, but we also had Gallo, right? And one of the things that Gallo always instilled in us is never forget the kitchen. Your first question is, what are you using for cooking wine? All right. I know we're fine wine people. We want to do other things, but that kitchen, that could be 10 to 20 cases a week. So don't forget about that when you walk in. Ask them what they're using for cooking wine. Uh, number one. Number two, those accounts in the same vein with Gallo, those beer bars and cocktail bars that no, everybody forgets about, those accounts are always going to be some of your best accounts. That If you can own that list, because they're not looking for 20 wine sales reps, if you can own that list of a beer and cocktail bar, you would be shocked. I used to have one in Boston, right? It was 15 to 20 cases a week. I owned the entire wine menu. I had no competition. No other wine people went in there because it was a beer and cocktail bar. But I own the list. I had every wine on there. I saw them every single week. And it was one of my best accounts. Don't forget about those people. But uh, as I said here, don't look down on any account. Your local dive bar still sells a lot of wine. Own the menu at your local dive bar. 
Sometimes the owner that knows nothing about wine and lets you write the whole menu is your biggest and best customer. That is an important one as well. I was so excited about that as a sales rep when I could write a full menu, anything I wanted, um, and 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 price it and everything. Um, lastly, do not take yourself too seriously. It's a fun business. Don't get too frustrated. Um, have fun with this. So, in twenty uh, on premise recovery here and beyond. It's what, what our expectations are in the industry expectations. Let's return the return of dining out frequency, lingering impact of financial insecurity, of course, the importance of value with smaller wine lists, food and wine fads and trends, social media and influencers. These are certainly things that we think will affect the restaurant business very well. What trends can you take to your customers? We're going to move pretty quick through here. This is where we get into some of our wines. So these are trends that are happening right now, almost unanimously agreed upon across the entire country, um, uh, both retail and on-premise, really. Uh, the first one would be values, value-based winemaking and purchasing, right? So low intervention, organic, biodynamic, fair for life. These things are hot right now, and it's consumers, it's buyers, it's psalms, it's it's suburban, you know, housewives and house dads, right? It's it certainly is is something that's out there. So here are some that we have available uh, that I think are important to point out. What I put on here are all the buy the glass, the average buy the glass pricing across the country. Don't hold me to this in every single state, of course, especially if you're in a high tax state like Georgia, let's say, um, but. This is this is certainly where they typically sit. So we have uh, Lee. Do you want to jump in here, or should I move quick because we don't have a lot of time? No, I think I think we should move quick, um, All right. really quickly in here. I think another thing that we could have put in here is uh, Pratch. Everything that Pratch family yeah. does is organic, and if you're selling that one liter at eleven dollars, it's a great value. And with screw cap and a little bit of dissolved CO2, it stays alive for three, three four days even. So uh, you know, lots of great options in the wine sellers portfolio here. So. Umo Blanco, biodynamic wine from Chile, from the Aracano, from uh, from uh, the actual Lurton family, uh, but the winery is Aracano. El Burro, natural Malbec from Santa from Santa Julia, Santa Julia organic Chardonnay, actually the fastest growing wine within Santa Julia right now. Tiamo Prosecco, the entire Tiamo line is organic. Please don't forget that. It's what makes it different and stand out from the other Proseccos out there. Um, and then we have our brand new, if you haven't seen it yet, exciting, fantastic wine, Schaefer Blanc de Noir, dry Blanc de Noir. Really a fantastic wine um, that is also made with organic grapes. So you can hit all different categories here. An important quote up top, farm to table does not stop at the food menu. Sustainable wine has to be part of the equation. Absolutely has to be. These should be some of the first things you present to your farm to table restaurants, which are still extremely um, exciting here. So you can get a copy of this. You'll see it later. This is the average by the glass, all of which are great, great price points. Emerging regions and varietals, people are branching out. Wine drinkers are trying new things. Even these millennial and younger millennial that are looking to, to slowly shift into wine, they get excited by emerging regions and varietals, things that they haven't heard of before. So go after it, right? Um, here again, we have a list of five wines that fit this category. We have Tarima Mediterraneo, which is about $9 by the glass. This is from Alicante, right? You guys know this wine. Alicante is an incredible seaside area on the uh, eastern uh, coast of Spain. The varietals are Moscatel and Merceguera, um, and certainly they are unique varietals in a unique area. This is one of the only wineries in Alicante, right? They own Alicante, for sure. Um, Vinum Chenin Blanc. Probably the most unique white from America, definitely the most unique white from the United States that we that we represent. So this is from Clarksburg. It's Chenin Blanc. The winemaker, uh, Chris Condos, was actually the one who originated uh, Pine Ridge's Chenin Blanc. So he has a long history with Chenin Blanc. And this is a wine worth trying if you haven't had it. It's, you know, about $11 by the glass. Uh, Polygonos Semillon, all right? I could have picked a lot of different Zuccardi wines. This is probably not by the glass. It could be for high-level dining, but potentially it's about a $50 or $60 bottle on the wine list. But this is Semillon from, from Tupangato in the Yuko Valley, right? Which is certainly something unique and emerging. Uh, Tarima Monastrel, which is, again, from Alicante, the varietals Monastrel. It's not something that the general American public is all that familiar with. Very value priced at $9. And then we have uh, Inazio Erzola. Um, the varietal here is 
Honduravi Zuri, right? And the area is Lee. You 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 say this better than me. Guitari Aiko, Sakalina, Chakalina. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Super unique area. This is about as geeky and Sami as it gets. There is not a lot of competitors, but if you go into your best restaurants, the James Beard awarded and, and voted restaurants, walk into them. You're going to see uh, uh, Chocolina's on the menu. So certainly that's one to keep an eye on. They also make a delicious rosé and they make a brand new natural wine. That is one of the most outstanding wines I've had in my life. And I'll be honest there. So that is her Neo, which is their new uh, natural uh, Chocolina. Keg wine, of course. Um, I, I'm not going to go through this in too much depth, but uh, depth. But keg wine and alternative packaging is super popular right now. Um, we sell a ton of it. <clears throat> this is our on-premise keg list. If you don't have this, ask your wine sellers person; they will get it to you. Uh, but we have plenty of them. We sell over 10,000 kegs a year in the United States. It is a big piece of business for us. This business grew by 16% in 2022, and it's up 23% year to date. Again, if you're not selling kegs to your restaurant, you're missing the boat. We've got them. And we also have tap handles for most of these kegs. Uh, our top 10 keg wines, again, you'll get this from us later, but Bella Fina Seco, Tiamo Organic Pinot Grigio, Santa Julia Reserva Malbec, Tiamo Organic Barbera, Proch Rosé, Proch Gruner, probably not a better wine to have on tap than Proch Gruner. I mean, in a beer hall, Proch Gruner by the by the keg, it's phenomenal. Grand Passione Rosso, Tortoise Creek Cab, Venom Insider Cab, and Venom Monterey Pinot. Sauvignon Blanc, also a very popular category right now. We have Sager and Verdier Sancerre here for $20 a bottle. We have O2 Estate Sauvignon Blanc, which is from uh, an estate in New Zealand called Ultawara Estate. $12 a bottle, fantastic bottle of wine, new to us this year. Santa Julia plus Sauvignon Blanc, also new. Sauvignon Blanc is a hot category. This is a $7 bottle of Argentinian Sauvignon Blanc that is phenomenal. Not flabby, high acid, really zingy, worth trying. Sancerre, out of stock everywhere. Nobody can get it. We have Le Charmel uh, Sauvignon Blanc, which is from Turin. It is also something worth looking into. When people are asking you for Sancerre and you don't have enough, you've got a Turin Sauvignon Blanc that is right next door from Le Charmel, and it is a great price at $9 a bottle. Uh, sea Pearl Sauvignon Blanc, which is our volumetric, easy drinking uh, Sauvignon Blanc from Par uh, Marlboro uh, for $10 a bottle. This is in full stock now. We've had inventory issues in the past. We do not now. It's fully available. We have as much as possible. We're even opening up kegs of this again, right, Lee? Yep, we have kegs available. And just to continue that Sauvignon Blanc, I know we've got a couple more trends, but we've got Tortoise Creek for those people that want domestic stuff too. Yes, and Tortoise Creek. So I couldn't fit everything on there. This isn't everything, but... Uh, bubbles, all right? This is also very popular. Sparkling wine is flying through the roof from all price points. We have a lot to choose, right? We have a Cremant uh, from Prosper Mafu, which is our Burgundy estate, $15 a bottle. They are the leaders in Cremant production. Am I correct, Lee? Yes. He's my fact one largest, One of the largest landholders, if not the largest landholder in all of Burgundy, mm -hmm. the FIFO family. So then we have Masfi Cava, of course, one of our most important wines. Most of you know it. We are launching soon Masfi Zero, zero alcohol uh, sparkling wine from Masfi. But certainly $8 a bottle, great bottle of wine for that price. Probably one of the most underdeveloped wines and most opportunistic wines in our portfolio sits right in the middle here with Fitzritter Sect. This wine is fantastic. Sparkling Riesling, extra trocken. It is a phenomenal wine for your geeky. I mean, go over New York City. We have this poured in a lot of geeky, song friendly wine bars. It is something that we are extremely excited about within our, if you go to a wine cellar's party with us, we're pouring uh, Fitzritter sect for sure. So something to worth looking at. It's $15 a bottle and it's really, really a great bottle of wine. And Riesling does very well sparkling. Of course, Besserat de Bellafon Champagne. Uh, hot, this is this this wine is in every Michelin star restaurant in France. It is uh, extremely popular because of its flavor profile, which is more friendly for food and high level dining. It is high acid, low bubble, smaller, finer bubble. So it is much more appreciative of pairing with food and it makes it very unique for restaurants. So don't forget Besserat de Bellafon. It's still a great price. Uh, probably not by the glassable at this point, but still a great price point and, and, a, and a lot of history goes into this winery. 
Carlos Serra's Brute, which we just launched last year. It's a new category in Rioja, and this is $13 a bottle. We worked them down so we could get this under 20 on a retail shelf, but this is a great buy-the-glass option for your restaurants, especially Spanish, of course, but really any of them. Um, and this is method traditional as well, remember. Uh, yeah, it's just, it, has this, it has almost the same exact classifications and, and necessary requirements as uh, champagne. As champagne, yes. Brook. Yeah. They, they, and Carlos Saris, the Vivanco family who owns this, they're leaders in this designation. They really helped to get it into a pro, in, into where it is today. So it's super, su really fantastic wine. And then Bellafina Prosecco, of course. This is a Frizzante wine, which is why it has the Stelvin closure. $8 a bottle, really easy drinking, great price point, great for restaurants uh, to have an easy drinking Frizzante wine. Also available in keg. Uh, and just a couple more slides, Scott. Cocktails. And for cocktails, a couple more slides. I'll move quick. Ultra premium and luxury. Although we talked about the financials out there and people being worried about money, as you know, since 2020, the rich got richer and the poor got poorer, right? It's unfortunate. It's a story that goes as old as time, but it is true. People with money are spending a lot of money because they made more and more and they continue to, right? When they don't have to worry about interest rates, they don't have to, they bought a ton of property when property values, you know, had sunk and before they rose again, when interest rates were in the tank. So, so anyway, these people are spending money and we have plenty of ultra premium. Ultra premium means it's over $30 cost and it can go up to anything, right? Luxury can go up to anything. So for us, some of our top options here, Jose Zaccardi for about $35 a bottle, which is fantastic wine after the, the very famous Jose. Um, Facil, which is a uh, honest, like honestly like a Chablis style wine uh, from San Pablo in the Yuko Valley. Fantastic wine from the Zaccardi family, about $40 a bottle. Pedro Infinita Gravascal, multiple hundred point ratings for this wine. Absolutely stunning. Some of the best wine I've had in my life. $165 a bottle. Um, this is uh, a Premier Cru from Saint Aubin from Prosper Mafu, Clos de Chateau, which is about $50 a bottle, right? One of the one of the best wines that these guys produce. Um, and then Ricosa, which is our new Piedmont producer, they have a Barolo Reserva, which is $35 a bottle. We'll also be launching an organic. Uh, Barolo, which will sit around that $30 price point as well soon, as soon as we have enough to bring into the United States. All right, so these are our top glassable wines for 2023 wine cellars across the whole United States. These are the top on-premise uh, uh, SKUs that we sell. Number one, Bellafina Prosecco. I'm not going to go through all of these. Green arrows mean from 2022 to 2023, these green arrows grew uh, exponentially. Bellafina went up three places. Sicardi Q went up five places. Santa Julia plus Pinot Grigio went up three places. So these are wines that are working everywhere. I like to start my investigation into what I want to present by looking at what's working. These are working across the entire United States. You have a lot of options in here, many of which we mentioned already. And it doesn't, listen, you see a lot of Santa Julian Zuccardi there. I didn't make these up. These are what the numbers show. These wines work. Get them in restaurants, pour them by the glass, and they will sell. They are selling. They're working everywhere. And it's not just wine bow markets. So certainly these are things that, that are worth looking at. And you'll get this in a little bit. Um, and, and organic wine is certainly something to keep your eye on. Um, and lastly, two more slides, uh, top, top glassable wines, uh, varietal wise, right? Pinot Grigio is number one for us, Malbec number two, Sparkling uh, as number three, as all sparkling, and then Prosecco on its own as number four, um, which is pulled out of sparkling. Sauvignon Blanc's five, but growing. Rosé is six, even though everybody's getting more and more tired of a billion rosés. Rosé is still a hot category. You know every one of you still drinks it in the summer, especially. Um, <clears throat> Cabernet, Riesling, Pinot Noir, white blends, Chardonnay, Tempranillo, and red blends, right? So this is how we look at our portfolio and say, what should we add to? What's working? These are the top wines we are selling in restaurants right now. And then these are our top glassable wines by country. So out of our portfolio, we sell 60,000 cases of Italian wine to restaurants. That's certainly the king uh, for us still. Argentina, 40,000. France, 30,000. Spain, 30,000. New Zealand, 15. USA, 15. 
Germany 12, and then Austria 6, which is surprising, right? A tiny little country like Austria, we're selling 6,000 cases to restaurants across the country. So certainly these are the categories we look at. We are expanding our selections within Italy, like you saw with Ricosa, because we see that opportunity. But Argentina still remains high up there on what restaurants are selling well, okay? And, and there's our names, uh, Lee and Matt Johnson, of course, our contact information. Um, any one of you that wants to reach out to us, Wine Cellars, small family business, you can. We're more than happy to engage in any way we can. Um, this presentation will be available from your Wine Cellar salesperson. Um, we really do thank you for your time. I, I apologize. We're about six minutes over, um, even with how fast I speak. But uh, thanks a lot for your time. If you have any questions that were put in the chat, um, we can, we'll answer them after. Um, I will send them over uh, uh, to Arjun and he can disperse them. Uh, but thanks for the time, everybody. And uh, we appreciate yep. your attention. Yes, yeah. Lee. Yeah, go. No, we're good. No, this is Arjun. Arjun. Um, first of all, I'd like to say a couple of words before we hang up. Uh, but, but let's give Matt and Lee a big round of applause, everyone, please. Nice job. Thank you. Thank you. Yay, Thank great you. job. Um, Wow, 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 wow. If you are um, a new sales consultant at Winebow and you've never really sold on premise, you just got lucky. Matt, I don't know how you guys did it, but you know, me coming from New York City and spending years on the street selling restaurants in Manhattan and Queens, um, you just got a very comprehensive crash course on how to approach a buyer. Um, seriously, it took like 20 years of experience, just mashed it into 66 <laughs> minutes. That was, that's probably one of my favorite hours I've spent learning about something in quite a while. Uh, maybe it's because it was more sales oriented, but I mean, it, it just put, took me back. Um, number one is as a wholesaler, you know, the restaurant has a, a fish purveyor, has a meat purveyor, probably has a water purveyor. And, and we want to be their, you know, fine wine and artisanal spirits purveyor. And that one, that mentality of the one-stop shopping is so true. There are so many buyers out there that want to just let the right sales consultant run their whole list. And as the lists have gotten compressed, uh, that still remains. And even if we have to call in the other orders to the other wholesalers, these restaurants don't have the staffing to do all of that. So there's a huge opportunity. I also loved the glass half full mentality. There's less by the glass, but when you get one, it's a lot more volume. I love that approach. I think that's really positive. And then lastly, well, two more things. One is the keg wine opportunity is huge, especially seasonal and especially with wine cellars. And then lastly, you know, wine cellars as a supplier, first of all, all the glassable opportunities of wine cellars, if you cross-reference the last few slides, and I'm so happy everybody's going to get a copy, not only do you have price points, but you have countries, regions, producers that the buyer can rely on. And the buyer can sound really intelligent if they choose these wines. They're going to look like an expert. So the buyer is going to look good. And on top of that, you've got for most of the states that Winebow has business with wine sellers in, there's wine sellers people on the street ready to go and page from the account. So amazing job. Uh, I It took me back. Um, but it also, I mean, the, the points are just so relevant. Uh, so powerful. I expect people are going to get a pay raise next week in the on-premise just by taking down three or four things here. And uh, really, um, I feel like I just got a shot of caffeine. Great job. Uh, please send questions our way. Uh, this was exactly, Matt, when we met and talked about Wine Cellars University. Uh, you really nailed it. You've been nailing it each time. The kind of thought thoughts, the data, and the work you put into this kind of presentation um, is uh, is really appreciated. I'll let my colleagues in the South take their own shots at you. 
after the call. Uh, and you fully deserve it. Um, but uh, we love you and we love wine cellars. And uh, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend. Great job. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, All everyone. Right. Take care, everyone. Thanks, guys. Have a great weekend. Matt. Yes. Thank you.